From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. into the U.S. Trading Day on this Tuesday, July 12th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Big test for margins. Financials kick off earnings season this week with margins and growth question marks. We got you covered. Morgan Stanley's Betsy Grasick and Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs. Euro's parity play. Euro dollar trades near one to one. Curve stays inverted. Tech though finds a bottom. Now what? Your playbook into earnings. And I'm definitely not visiting Guy anytime soon. London's Heathrow Airport will ask airlines to stop selling tickets for summer travel. The latest pain for carriers. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome everyone to Bloomberg Markets. Just in case I was going to buy that ticket this summer to come visit Cornwall, I'm not doing it because that is crazy. I don't think I've ever heard of an airport asking carriers to shut down like that. Yeah, I think we're going to see more of it. To be fair, though, if you were to come and see me, you would get quite a good deal in as much as the currency is definitely in your favor. The dollar is going up, up, up. Parity against the, uh, the euro, we're not too far away in some ways uh, on the pound. I suspect mm -hmm. if you tried to change money at Heathrow, you'd probably get it. So, yeah, you could have a great time over here. Well, in that case, I'm going here. to Paris, man. I'm not going to UK. I'm going to avoid Heathrow <laughs> altogether and then take advantage of parity and buy all the croissants and red yeah. wine in Paris. How about that? Yeah. Okay, that would be where I would splurge my money in terms of the shopping trip that I'm sure you're planning in the back of your mind. Um, we, are, we are certainly watching that story develop very, very quickly. The question we're asking today, though, Alex, because you've taken us in a completely different direction, You're welcome. is what is happening <laughs> with the margin story. We're about to get into earnings season. We're about to see potentially a margin meltdown. The two are not completely unrelated. I, we are going to see corporate results being very much affected by this strong dollar. Uh, but the, the margin story, I think, is going to be front and center. We get into the banks, first of all, clearly. So what does that mean? That means we need to ask this question, of course, to our Wall Street correspondent, Shanali Basak. Uh, we've got our cross-asset reporter. And yesterday's anchor did a great job yesterday, Katie Greifeld, joining us as well. Shanali, let me ask you the question, first of all. What does a margin meltdown look like at the banks? We are very worried. We are watching carefully to see what's going to happen with loan loss provisions, what the macroeconomic environment is going to look like, but how will it actually crystallize into this bank reporting season? It's a great question, Guy, because even though net interest income is expected to rise and banks are supposed to make more money on trading desks, given that the volatility is higher, but not stifling, you still have that issue that that volatility really starts to stifle deal making and equity and debt issuance. So if you take a look at it, high yield spreads have already blown out quite a bit. They've come in a little bit, but they're still two percentage points higher than you've seen on average. That means when they're pumping the economy with money, when they're lending to clients, it is already getting significantly more expensive to do so. So you have a very double edged sword here, even though they are supposed to make money in some places. Will they make enough money to really want to take on a lot more risk, especially when it comes to clients across different parts of the bank. I would also mention that this earnings season is starting in a face of a 210 yield curve that is uh, inverted significantly enough to make people worried about the future. And so all of those future comments about how willing they are to lend to risky clients and how much risk they're willing to take on into the future everyone will be reading those tea leaves. Yeah, and it's kind of the same thing with other companies as well, Katie, right? I mean, we all know the margin pressure has come, mm -hmm. but it's how strong that top line will be and then how confident uh, the CEOs have in their business model for the rest of the year, knowing that that consumer demand can be very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And we are going to get these numbers. We know they're probably going to be terrible, even though if you look at some of the sell side estimates, not really coming down. But just listening to the mood music coming from C-suite executives over the past few weeks, it feels like some of this has already been priced in. I mean, if you look at the S&P 500 down about 19 percent year to date, the Nasdaq 100 down 27 percent. I mean, the question is out there. Have we already priced in what we're about to get? We know the numbers are going to be really bad. Uh, but yet, I mean, the markets are a forward looking vehicle. Uh, we'll see. There probably will be headline risk, and I would expect these single stock equities. This was the story last yep. season that there was so much volatility in the single names. But on the index level, I mean, maybe we're already there. 
Kenny, I'm going to try and weave in where Alex start, where sort of Alex started, which was on what's happening at Heathrow. Heathrow has a labour problem. Mm -hmm. Which parts of the equity market also have a labour problem? Bloomberg Intelligence ran the numbers, and they're looking at stocks that have greater labour inputs into the bottom line suffering the most. Is that where we should be looking for the distinction here? If you are capital intensive, if you are labour intensive, that's going to be the distinction here in terms of the margin squeeze. I feel like the labor costs are the wild card here because we've been talking about the input costs, the price of everything going up, but labor costs, I feel like that was the wild card last season. When you think about Amazon coming out and saying that they were overstaffed, that took a lot of people by surprise, especially traders just looking at the reaction in Amazon. I believe we got something similar from uh, Walmart or Amazon or um, Target, can't quite remember, but the degree to which some of these corporations, both in the tech sector, as we learned, and in the retail space, staffing up, trying to account for some of the incredible demand. Now we're sort of seeing the other side of that, where these companies have had to pull back on that. And that is going to be something really to watch in the next few weeks. Yeah, and Guy, to your point, you know, if I look at the NFIB that came out earlier today, it was a terrible number. But specifically, if you looked at those recipients that are looking at a better business environment over the next six months, that dropped by seven points now to a negative 61 percent. And those amazing, are the guys that are really hiring uh, all the people. So if you make stuff, maybe it's okay. If you're selling the stuff, maybe that's when we run into more problems. Well, I just think, I, I think the smaller the business, the less the less opportunity it has to deal with the, to deal with the problem mm -hmm. of, of the labor market. If you're a bigger company, you have maybe more opportunity to hire, hire more easily. That's going to be a huge challenge for smaller companies. Uh, I think it's going to be the toughest, the toughest place is going to be right at the bottom in terms of the size of a business. If you're kind yeah. of 50 or, or 100 uh, person business, that's where I think the real pain is going to be felt here. Yeah, Shanali, and I wonder sort of the distinction then to be made between big banks then and regional banks and then the credit card companies, because those guys, the two ladders, are going to be much more exposed to this kind of risk yeah. than, say, the J.P. Morgans. It's an amazing question to ask, because you look at how stocks are already trading. If you look at J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, these tend to have not only large clients, but also high net worth clients. You have to ask yourself, is it just big companies or big companies that are also serving wealthy customers that are shielded from some of these inflationary concerns? Those two banks are trading well above book value, while many of the others are either at or below. Bank of America also, they say their consumer is in good shape, but what about, to your point, the rest of the country's banks? When you look at the loan officer data already, you see that in the first quarter, there was a lot of types of lending that was unchanged. And that was before the economic situation started to de deteriorate more significantly and rates started to rise more significantly. So to your point, guys, you know, can companies not only withstand some of the margin pressure that they're seeing, can they get the things that they need, the, the revenue, the, the loans at, a, at an affordable yep. price to make it towards the next step of uh, this, this economic cycle? Katie, final quick question to you. If I strip out energy, how different does the picture look? It looks pretty different. I mean, just in the last few weeks, it feels like the, the bloom has come off energy stocks. But if you look at the sector level, it stuck out to me this morning that if you look at consumer staples, they are the uh, the outperformer other than energy, only down 5%, only 5%. You compare that again to the S&P 500, down 19%. It really shows you what is front and center in investors' minds. It's which of these companies can actually pass on these higher costs, protect their margins a little bit, and it seems like it's consumer staples. Um, and then last quick question from me, and Katie, I'll throw this to you. The other wild card seems to be what happens with the dollar. We already saw Microsoft warm with that. The Bloomberg dollar index up by about 5.5% in the second quarter. Um, have we already priced in? In that dollar strength or do you expect kind of more potential downgrades or warnings to come? I would expect that we're going to see it a lot in earnings calls talking about those FX headwinds. I mean Microsoft kicked us off early with that warning back in May but I would expect that it's going to be a common theme uh, as we really dig into some of these reports. It's going to be fun. I'm excited. All right guys thanks a lot Bloomberg Chanel Bassick and Katie Greifeld for joining us. We appreciate it. So coming up we're going to continue the theme. Second quarter earnings starting to roll out. Goldman's chief global equity strategist Peter Oppenheimer expects profit margins to contract. By how much we'll break that down. He joins us next. This is Bloomberg.
I think the story for the next year is gigantic margin compression from really extraordinary levels, which obviously poses a question for equity investors because of, uh, of earnings compression. But from the Fed's perspective, from a market perspective, what it means is that the pace of disinflation over the next year, I think, is likely to be quite a lot quicker than markets expect. That was Pantheon's Ian Shepardson earlier on Bloomberg Television. That takes us back to our question of the day. Are we about to see a margin meltdown? I want to put that question to Peter Oppenheimer, Chief Global Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Peter, it's a lot to break down. Let's just start in the U.S. for a moment. Are we prepping for a margin meltdown? Is it going to happen? Well, I think we will get margins uh, coming down, and that's typical as you get economic downturns. Margins are very sensitive to that. And in a sense, really, the surprise of the last quarter was how well both revenues and margins held up. Now, some of that was because actually nominal GDP, which companies are making a claim on, has been quite strong because of higher inflation. But it's also because you had a lot of pent-up demand and savings following the pandemic. And many companies were able to pass on those higher costs, and that's beginning to wane, I think. So certainly... Uh, it's not just that earnings are going to be weaker. The market is expecting that, even though consensus numbers have yet to come down. But it's really the forward guidance and the margin that I think is going to be of greatest interest. And that's the area of greatest vulnerability, I think. Is that priced, do you think, Peter? Uh, it's priced to the extent that, from the best we can tell, looking, for example, at how the most economically sensitive companies have been performing relative to those that are quite defensive, for example, uh, a mild recession is being priced uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, a, a slightly deeper one in Europe. But I don't think the market is really poised for any significant or prolonged recession. Now, to be fair, there are some important supports. Private sector balance sheets are quite strong, mm -hmm. banks, households and corporates. And in the case of Europe, at least, there's quite a big fiscal boost that's helping to support growth as well. But I do think earnings numbers will still come down quite a bit. And whether we end up with a recession or not, mm -hmm. I think there's a good chance that markets will price that probability as being higher uh, than they have done as yet. So, Peter, does your base case incorporate a potentially recessionary or slowdown in that we get the margin squeeze now and then we get weaker demand later? Is that your base case? That's right. Yes, it is. Um, our base case is based on our economist uh, central forecast where they have only a 50-50 probability broadly of recession as they define it. Um, but we are expecting much lower numbers than the consensus. Right. As I said, consensus numbers really typically are quite slow to come down at turning points. Markets tend to move a lot quicker. And we should say also that equities tend to start to recover from bear markets six to nine months before earnings begin to improve. So, as you said earlier, they are about anticipating the future. And some of this downturn has been priced, but not enough. And I think as perhaps you were saying earlier, valuations are not really yet at levels consistent with recessions, particularly in the US. And I think there's probably more valuation okay. compression that can come through. Peter, can we, just, can we just deal with the top line and what happens in the middle of the P&L and the sequencing as to how this is going to unfold? At the moment, we're starting to see margin pressure coming through. Costs are rising, be it labour costs, be it sort of input costs more broadly. So that's starting to impact what is happening in the middle. At the top, inflation is supporting a top line, plus, as you say, actually, the macroeconomic backdrop with savings relatively strong continues to support the top line. Are we, though, as we go through into the recession, going to see the top line weakening but the margin squeeze easing, or does the margin squeeze continue because actually the pressure on the labour market is going to be maintained and actually the supply chain story doesn't ease, and you end up with the worst of both worlds, the top line comes down but the margins continue to the input cost story r remains relatively high because yes. that's a one-two punch that is going to really have a big impact on the bottom line. Yes, and that, that sequencing is not uh, unusual going into downturns. It's a, really a question of to what extent do you get top line and margin moderating and which sees the greatest pressure. Now, I would say actually revenue growth, top line, is not likely to be so weak and that's partly because inflation is higher and nominal GDP is higher. Also, remember, there still is a lot of pent-up demand that we're seeing. 
the discussion you've just had about uh, airports and it is a very good example. It's not that there's a lack of demand, it's really an issue of supply. So but I think Pete, revenue Peter, but, can hold up, but costs are, but, are still but the fear, rise. But, it, but if I just, just to jump in here, the fear for Heathrow, the, he, the fear for European airlines is that you have this huge surge this summer, nobody can cope, margins get squeezed, unions get decent pay rises, those are sticky, but come the autumn, actually demand collapses, but the costs are still there. That's the, that's the fear. How big a risk is that for equities? Well, it, it's a risk from a structural perspective, because I think you have to look at where we've come from. Context matters a lot. If you look at profit margins, they've been ri rising relentlessly for the last 20 years and reached all-time record highs in the US uh, and close to that in other regions as well. And there's lots of reasons why margins have done well. Um, un uh, un uncontained globalization, uh, very plentiful and cheap commodities and labor for a long period of time mm -hmm. have contributed to that as well. And as we get more regionalization, less growth in world trade, and as you say, energy and labor is more scarce and more expensive, we would expect margins to begin to come down. Part of that is cyclical. Mm -hmm. You tend to get margins weakening in an economic slowdown. And part of it is probably structural as well. And that's why we've been arguing that investors should be focused less on revenue growth, which was what they rewarded above all else in the decade after the financial crisis, supported by very, very cheap interest rates, and yeah. focus more on the quality of balance sheets and margin sustainability within and across sectors, because I think that will become more valuable as an attribute. Um, is there also the possibility here that we get too pessimistic when we look at all the challenges, like you said, and I understand the sequencing uh, into a slowdown, but uh, JP Morgan, strategist led by Marco Kalinovic, uh, talked about how most investors are already positioning for a recession and sentiment is weak. And if an economic disaster doesn't materialize, risky assets can substantially recover. What would be your take on something like that? And if there is a recovery, where might we see it first? Yes, well, I, I would agree that, that uh, the markets uh, and most investors are increasingly anticipating or positioning for the worse for a recession. Uh, it's not inevitable that we get recessions or certainly deep and prolonged ones, bearing in mind some of the other supports that I mentioned. You know, labour markets are still very strong. Private sector balance sheets are healthy. In the areas that are most at risk, like Europe, you're also getting fiscal support. Um, so if a recession is not as bad as investors yep. eventually end up pricing, there will be a good recovery. And typically, uh, the recovery from a bear market is triggered by a clear peak in inflation and interest rates. So that would be one of the important things to look for. And initially, it would likely be rebound, a, re a strongest rebound by the areas that have fallen the most and the areas that are most levered to an economic improvement. I think what happens after right. that, though, is, is going to be a different story with slower returns for some time to come. Peter, final quick question from me. Um, Europe, basically, we're waiting, we're watching, we're trying to understand what, A, Russia's going to do, and, B, what China's going to do. In the meantime, it looks like a very bleak environment. So the question we've been asking a lot of our guests today, it's our MLife question of the day, is, is a recession in Europe inevitable? What's your perspective? Again, I don't think it's inevitable. Um, where our economists are basically looking at stagnant growth in the second half of the year, uh, with Germany and Italy that are more exposed to Russian gas in particular uh, being in recession. Uh, a lot will depend on what happens to gas supplies uh, as we move forward into the latter part of the summer and beyond. And that will determine whether there's a broad recession and I think how deep. Uh, one of the benefits, as I uh, would say, of Europe, though, is that there is a fiscal expansion coming through uh, and many governments are already intervening to try to reduce the negative shock or moderate it from a uh, real income squeeze uh, to protect consumers to some degree. It won't prevent a recession. It may moderate the extent of it. And do bear in mind at least that European markets are much cheaper. They're trading roughly at around 10 to 11 times P. That's below the long-run average. 
uh, at maybe not at, at, at really uh, stressed valuations, but certainly starting to look quite attractive. And we think the dividends broadly are sustainable over time. So there is some value beginning to come through there. Peter, great to have some of your time today. Thank you very much indeed for sharing it with us. Peter Thanks, Oppenheimer, sorry. Chief Global Equity Strategist, joining us from Goldman Sachs. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash to look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Ritika Gupta. American Airlines is sticking with its expectations for a jump in second quarter sales despite rising costs. In a filing, Americans said total revenues are expected to be up 12% in the period compared with the same quarter in 2019. Meanwhile, costs for each seat flown a mile will also rise about 12%. And PepsiCo has raised its outlook for the second quarter in a row. The maker of Mountain Dew, Fritos and Quaker Oats expects revenue to grow 10% this year as consumer demand remains resilient. PepsiCo's North American food and beverage business remains strong during the quarter. Meanwhile, demand for convenient foods helps international markets continue to perform. And Peloton is taking one of the most dramatic steps yet to simplify operations and reduce costs. The company will quit building exercise bikes and treadmills at its own factories. Partners will now handle manufacturing. Peloton is making the change after several months of turmoil. The company cut nearly 3,000 employees earlier this year and shares down some 75% this year. And that is your latest business splash. Alex, Sky. All right, thanks so much, uh, Ritika. So this could actually go a long way in helping build up its cash reserve, Guy. And at the same time, they're trying to like move people more to this subscription model. They have 2.66 million subscribers. So they could do that, cut their costs there, and still only hike membership fees a little bit. Like maybe they have a chance to really grow their subscriber base here. What do you think about it? What would you want to do right now if you were a, a, a company that was struggling? You'd want to provide as much simplicity as you can. And simplifying the supply chain looks like a really logical thing to do. Why would you have an internal and an external supply chain? Why would you go with that dual structure? Why don't you just go with one of them? For instance, an external supply chain, remove the risk from you, put it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. As you say, focus on the service side of the business. That, that's ultimately, in theory, where the value is. I appreciate that some technology companies like Apple do very well off the hardware, but a lot of value has been created in services recently. Yeah, you also have to wonder too, like how much has the pandemic boost been wrung out? Like has it all been? Like can we now really value the company on its fundamentals rather than, uh, rather than COVID? I don't know. I thought you were gonna ask me what would I rather do? Be in a Peloton or go for a run or something? And I was like, uh, I'd rather nap, thanks. Well, yeah, of course. Obviously. That goes without saying. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, yeah. coming up, US Bank earnings kicking off Thursday. We'll look ahead with Betsy Grasick. This is Bloomberg. I also think that interest rates could go up a couple hundred basis points and, and not throw us in a recession. Because I think that there's been just so much capital splashing around uh, that I think, you know, the first kind of major swallows of, of reducing that, that excess flow, I don't think are going to have quite the impact that the stock market is reflecting. That was uh, David Rubenstein's exclusive interview with real estate titan Sam Zell. Always fun to get his perspective. You can catch that full interview tonight at 9 p.m. All right, we're about an hour into trading. I gotta say, it's hard to find a direction here. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking some of these whippy moves today. Abigail? Well, Alex, you're right about that. It certainly is hard to find a direction. This is an intraday, an overnight chart of the NASDAQ 100 futures. And you can see, for the most part, down, starting slightly higher, though, last night. And then around the time of the open, up sharply and now back down. So net-net, a small loss but lots of moves to get there. As for a pocket of strength, we have uh, lots of names trading in the green. So let's not see, let's see whether or not we can see the major indexes uh, go up here, return to the, uh, the upside. American Airlines up 9%, absolutely soaring after they pre-announced to the upside. Uh, the current quarter, excuse me, the last quarter, the second quarter, 12% revenue growth over the previous year, plus they're holding the outlook. Investors really cheering that. Herbalife also uh, being cheered by investors up 15%. Jeffrey's 
Brothers has upgraded it to a buy. Peloton up 4.6% as the company is going to outsource the manufacturing of the bike. So traders, investors saying that could help this company's uh, margins and also the turnaround they're trying to make. And the Norwegian Cruise Lines up 4.3%, a bit of a big travel bid here. As for a mixed bag on the year, some big moves to the upside, some big moves to the downside. It, of course, is uh, currencies, and one of them being the dollar, the dollar on the year up for a second year. I believe it is up uh, double digits. I could be wrong on that. I know that the dollar against the yen is certainly up double digits, the most since 2013. But you can see that this is really pushing down commodities, including, including oil. In fact, let's take a closer look at oil in the Bloomberg terminal. We're going to see that oil has a pretty good shot of going back down to its 200-day moving average. We've been talking about that for quite some time, even when the 200-day moving average was below 80. Now it's right around 93. It seems all but certain technically that you will see oil go back down to that 200-day moving average. If that's the case, it happened uh, late last year. How much further below that 200-day moving average will it go? And, Guy, the question is, how much will that play through to the economy, provide relief for consumers uh, and businesses, frankly, everybody, uh, if the price of oil goes down? Maybe some relief around the recession call? We'll have to see whether all this happens. But it is certainly an interesting uh, factor to keep an eye on. Yep, it's going to be a huge subject later on this week as we watch what happens with the president's trip to the Middle East. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's turn back to the earnings season. Wall Street Bank earnings kicking off, of course, Thursday. We've got JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Uh, it then gets pretty busy on Friday. Betsy Grasek, who heads Morgan Stanley's bank's research team, downgrading some names due to rising recession risks ahead of those earnings. Betsy joins us now. Betsy, what are you going to be looking for? What is the standout story going into this earnings season? Well, thanks so much, Guy, for having me on. And I would say there's going to be, uh, like we've seen in the past couple of earnings seasons, some positives and some risks. On the positive side, rates are higher. That's a plus. Loan growth is off the charts, really hot. But there are negatives out there. Number one, deposit betas are rising, in particular, online savings accounts. Check your website, bankrate.com. It has you know, the most recent numbers, and we've had really rapid hikes in deposit rates. Um, we think deposit outflows at some banks are likely to come through, and that's a function of what the Fed's doing, QT. We've got expenses on the rise with inflation pressures, and frankly, at some of the institutions, we're expecting some buybacks to stop, in particular at B of A, Citi, and JPM, after the Fed did effectively what is a capital call by driving up their required yeah. uh, regulatory requirements on capital a couple weeks ago. So there's a lot. At the same time, <laughs> we've had a lot of volatility, which can help trading revenue. And I wonder, is this like the last quarter where that good part can outweigh the rest of the bad stuff that you kind of laid out? Alex, totally agree that trading is going to be a bright spot. Our estimates are for trading to be up year on year in the double digits. Um, that said, there is some pressure on investment banking fee revenues. We're talking about here things like underwriting and M&A, uh, which is well known in the stocks, you could argue. But the question is, when's the uplift going to come? Will it be second half this year or will it be into next year? I think some management teams will talk about really strong pipelines, but the question is the execution. When does that really start to accelerate? Our estimates, we have to wait for 2023. In terms of what they're going to say going forward, what do you think the tone is going to be? What do you think the fear around credit, lending, et cetera, is going to look like? Do you think these banks are going to signal that we're heading towards a recession? So it's a great question, Guy. I think for the most part, the commentary around credit will be very benign. Why do I say that? We look at the delinquencies every month, and you can see delinquencies are very low, and delinquencies today are your losses six months out. So losses are probably set to be fairly modest over the next six months. The question is the stocks look forward more than that, right? The stocks are looking forward one year, two year. And as we look into 23, we have to get through that really cold winter with still high energy prices and you have a lower savings rate. Savings rate now is at hovering around 5%. It is at 12 year lows. So how are we gonna get through the, not the next six months, 
but the six to 18 months, mm -hmm. our expectation is that we will have some pressure during that period. Okay, so Betsy, you cover literally anything that's exposed to the consumer, like American Express, you also do regionals and big banks. Is this gonna be a case that like big wins, like big banks and then regionals and then, um, and then the credit card companies? Is that how we're gonna see that kind of um, a difficult environment play out? For the consumer, I think we're talking about, look, the, the consumer with the lowest income level is the most stretched by inflation. I think you know, we're all aware of that and, and it's tough for them. Ally Financial had a great chart in their slide deck last earnings, which showed you that the lowest 10% of the income earners has a big piece of their disposable income, of their income going to gas at the pump, something like 15, 16%. So I think it's going to play out with regard to your portfolio. Where are you most exposed to subprime? You're going to have the highest degree of pressure. Where are you most exposed to Super prime, you'll have a lower degree of pressure. That said, we did uh, downgrade Amex today in part because we're anticipating through our AlphaWise survey that our um, research teammates did, high-end consumers pulling back on spending over the next six months due to concerns around inflation and the impact on the economy. So I think you'll be seeing it over the next six months, but at earnings to mm -hmm. this week and next week, I think the management teams will be very benign on their credit commentary with the caveat that, look, reserving, reserve releases are over and reserve ratios need to stay flat here. So your, your provision numbers will be a little bit higher. Betsy, is it possible at this stage to quantify the effect of QT, quantitative tightening, <laughs> on the banking sector? It's an estimate. I don't think we can quantify it with specifics. Just looking at the H8 that's coming through, we do see that deposit growth is slowing and it's running at about half pace of loan growth. So, you know, the way I've been positioning it is inflation is a capital call. Your borrowers need more money to do what they've been doing all along. And QT is slowing your access to funding. Mm -hmm. So it's a pressure point for the banks. And, and I think we're, we see QT come through first. We'll be in the trust banks, BK State Street Northern. Northern Trust at our conference last month said that they are expecting deposits to be down roughly, you know, mid single digits. Um, so we did get some word from them. But for the system overall, it's really hard to see right now. Uh, Betsy, we can't let you go without making your case for your top bank right now. Uh, what would you be, a, what's a buy right now? Wells Fargo is our top pick, and that is a function of two things. One, they are the most benefited from rate rises. And, and to put a point on that, we do expect most banks will be raising their NII guide because of the you know, forward curve and, and how much the Fed's already raised so far Q to date. Secondly, since they do have the asset cap, they did not accept as much deposits as peers during QE, so they have less excess deposits leaving them. Uh, third, they do have a plan to bring down expenses and, and you know, they're still on the 51 and a half billion for this year. Our expectation is they will hit that. So you do have actual dollars coming down this year, which puts them in a category pretty close to one. Betsy, for the group. such great stuff. We love talking to you. Wonderful insight. Good luck this weekend. Betsy Grasick, Morgan Stanley, Global Head of Banks and Diversified Financial Research. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, the drama that will never end. you got Twitter versus Musk, the legal maneuvering very much underway. So who is the stronger legal case? We're going to ask the man considered uh, as the dean of U.S. security law, John Coffey of Columbia Law School. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishika Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Nathan Sheet, City Global Chief Economist, joining Balance of Power at Noontime in New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. The Conservative Party wants to narrow a wide field of contenders to be Britain's next Prime Minister. It will require candidates to have the initial support of 20 Tory members of Parliament. Nominations will open and close today with the first ballot to be held on Wednesday. The party's new leader and therefore the UK's next Prime Minister will be announced September the 5th. 
President Biden and Mexico's President Andres Manuel López Obrador will discuss ways to expand legal migration and improve security when they meet today at the White House. They'll announce joint actions to improve infrastructure and cooperation along the almost 2,000-mile border. López Obrador says increasing immigration would strengthen the U.S. labor force and help curb inflation. In Shanghai, there are fears the city is heading back into a lockdown a little more than five weeks after exiting what was a two-month ordeal. The city reported 59 new coronavirus cases on Monday. That is the fourth day in a row that the case numbers have been above 50. The detection of a new substrain of the Omicron variant triggered two more rounds of mass testing in Shanghai. Global News 24 hours today on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Alex. All right, thanks so much, Ritika. So Twitter down about 10% just in the last two days. The company is expected to file suit this week over Elon Musk's decision to terminate his $44 billion takeover. And the company's lawyers call that move invalid and wrongful. Joining us now, the man considered the dean of security law in the U.S., John Coffey of Columbia Law School. Uh, Professor, it's great to get your perspective. Legally. Pleasure to be here. Legally, what's the strongest case that Musk can make, and what's the strongest legal case that Twitter can make? Well, I think everyone agrees that Twitter has the much stronger legal case. Their case is he can't complain about all these risks because he assumed them. He could have done due diligence back before he signed the deal on the bots. He could have put representations and warranties into the contract. He did none of that, and therefore he's deemed to assume the risk. Musk is saying that, well, this is a huge risk, but actually it's not a material adverse effect because there's been no change. Whatever that percentage of bots is, which no one knows, uh, it's not something you can show has changed in a way that materially worsens his position from what it was before when he didn't investigate them. Now, behind all this, I've got to point out, there is a mystery. We all agree, every professor, every practitioner, that Twitter's case is stronger. But if that's true, hasn't the Twitter stock come up significantly? It fell last night to under $33. $33 versus the fifty-four twenty that Musk has offered. If the Delaware court is going to order him to perform his deal, it's going to give Pacific performance, he's going to have to pay fifty-four twenty, and all the ARBs are missing something by not buying the stock in the interim mm. up to get up to 40, 45, yep. maybe even higher. Now, that's the mystery. Uh, makes you wonder, pro Professor, it makes you wonder what it's worth if on a standalone basis what the business would be worth. Maybe there's significant downside that is offsetting that risk, the upside, sure. but I hear what you're saying. Nobody sure can quite is, figure if out. An investor, if you're an investor yep. and Delaware is going to order him to pay you 54.20, you don't have a long-term view about Twitter. You're going to take the money and run. Do you think that is really going to happen, though? Do you think that is the um, most likely outcome? Because if it's not, and I appreciate what everybody says about the stronger hand, but if the ultimate result is that, that we still get a negotiated deal, i.e. that we well, settle, then, the, then, that price is, then that price is probably a bit too high. I think that is quite correct, but I think the market is betting, predicting what the negotiation will be. Mm -hmm. uh, understand that uh, 54.20 to 33, is, that's like a 15, 17 billion dollar difference. It's a huge amount to be at stake in one litigation. And I think the real concern is whether or not Delaware will grant something called specific performance. Specific performance is like an injunction. It requires you to perform the deal as it was originally contracted and not just to pay damages. Right. Professor? As as to pay damages, it's much less. If is there precedence for Delaware doing that? I'm just trying to understand how a court can force somebody to plop down like $33 billion of their own money and force them to buy a company. What's the precedence? Well, courts are good at that. If you disobey an injunction, you are in contempt. And the court can use a number of remedies of someone who's in contempt. It is rare, but they can send someone to prison until he does comply with the court's order. That happened. Journalists do get sent to prison when they refuse to testify, when they have a valuable evidence that the prosecution wants. So while I say it's very rare, uh, Mr. Musk is the one person I can think of who can be so flamboyantly defiant that a court might do that. Uh, he can't continue to present himself as above the law, which is the image he usually gives. So we're going to be watching not just the arguments in court, 
but what the market price is doing is that the market price of Twitter starts coming up. It suggests that the market either has learned that the negotiations are getting closer to a deal and maybe what the deal is, or that they think that this will go to a decision and the court's going to impose specific performance on them. It's going to be a day by day negotiation, both in court and in the private negotiations. I'm just trying to work out what the impact on Twitter would be if Elon Musk was in jail. That would certainly <laughs> change the, uh, the narrative online. I don't think Mr. Musk, I don't think he'll like jail. I think pretty quickly he'll decide he will comply. But what's always said about someone who's put to jail for contempt is that the uh, prisoner holds the courthouse keys in his hands. All he's got to do is comply. And if he starts complying, which yeah. he can do, although it would really destroy the price of Tesla if he has to make those kind of sales, uh, he can get himself out of jail. I don't think he's been that, in jail that's, like him. Yeah, I, I, th these, this, is, this is a pretty extreme scenario we're painting here. Um, Professor, just talk me through how you would... If you were Twitter and you were trying to get the best deal for your shareholders, presumably you wouldn't want to take any deal to lower price because you'd expose yourself to legal risk there as well. Your but the, could but let's assume. But let's in. assume that... Yeah, let's assume that you couldn't... Let's assume you didn't think you're going to get the 54 as well. How do you run it internally, do you think? You've got a negotiating team, you've got a legal team. How much interplay do you think there would be between those two teams? Well, they can talk to each other, but usually they're going to keep their own negotiations going. Um, I think, by the way, the board is protected by the business judgment rule. If they decide the best deal they can get is $47, I don't think a court is going to second-guess them. But they got to do something. They can't sit there with the price of 33 and not sue. And they got to pursue that suit. Yep. Otherwise, they're exposed on the other side. Professor, always yes. a pleasure. Really interesting conversation. I read your notes with a great deal of enthusiasm this morning. John Coffey, Columbia Law School. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, what did Donald Trump know about the role of the Proud Boys in the attack on Capitol Hill? The January 6th committee will be asking that very question today when public hearings resume. More next. This is Bloomberg. The January 6th committee resumes its public hearings today in D.C. to find out if extremists like the Proud Boys were encouraged by or even conspired with Donald Trump, uh, former President Donald Trump. Joining us now, Bloomberg Washington correspondent Joe Matthew on Capitol Hill. Hey, Joe, uh, give us the lay of the land and what to expect today. Well, you just said it in a nutshell here. Today is about the process of connecting the dots. We've heard that the, the Trump uh, ecosystem, if you will. Those who were in his orbit were in touch with those groups, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. But who was it? And did Donald Trump have plausible deniability? Was Rudy Giuliani speaking with them? Others in the president's orbit like Roger Stone? These are some of the questions that we hope will be answered today as we explore the term convergence as Jamie Raskin, the congressman, Democratic congressman on this panel, likes to call it. They want to make it at least, uh, build the case at least, to show that the White House knew that there were, in fact, armed militias here in Washington on the day that the president predicted that it would be wild. Joe, we were also expecting primetime hearings Thursday. They look like they've been postponed. I'm trying to understand yep. why. What, is hap what, what, what was expected Thursday that now can't happen? Well, this was going to be the grand finale on Thursday, and we expect to see a testimony even potentially from Steve Bannon. But things uh, changed at the last minute. At least yesterday, we understand that they postponed it likely for a week, though they could wait more time than that. This was supposed to be the grand finale in prime time, much like this series of hearings began. Keep in mind, Steve Bannon now has been cleared by the former president, Donald Trump, to testify before this committee. He's essentially lifted uh, executive privilege, even though Steve Bannon is still going on trial next week for initially refusing to testify under that subpoena. He's been indicted, and nobody would like him to testify more than Donald Trump, as he feels like there's no one there to defend him on this panel. And, of course, that was a decision by the minority leader in the House, Kevin McCarthy, to pull out of this committee. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we're looking at uh, President Trump still tweeting on his own platform about this. What kind of reaction do you expect from him? 
a predictable one, uh, and, and he takes every opportunity uh, to tell people to sign up uh, for Truth Social, his, his platform, knowing well that he'd prefer to be on Twitter with tens of millions of followers here. But, of course, the president is thinking about his own brand as we head for the midterm elections here, noting that there's a new poll out today by The New York Times and Siena College that shows a good number of Republicans, nearly half of Republicans in this poll, would rather see someone other than Donald Trump seek the nomination in 2024. Joe, we're going to leave you there. Thank you very much indeed for updating us. Joe Matthew joining us from Capitol Hill. Don't miss, of course, Sound On on Bloomberg Radio, weekdays, 5 p.m. Eastern with Joe. Interesting times. Let's talk about where we are in the markets. Interesting times there as well. Euro dollar currently trading at 10052. We got to one spot, 0003 at 1146. We're going to talk about that story next. Janet Henry is going to be joining us from HSBC, Global Chief Economist. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.